Well, welcome to the ELD MOOC 2015. Welcome to this session on stakeholder engagement. I am Claudia Musekamp and I am the tutor for this ELD MOOC along with Ali Salha uh, based in the US now. Today I am very happy to um, present two speakers to you. First of all, um, I'd like to welcome Emmanuel Kileru. Um, Emmanuel Kileru was already involved in the first ELD MOOC and she has uh, written the script of both MOOCs and I think those scripts are the rock that uh, these MOOCs are built on. So um, thanks for uh, I think doing a great job in uh, writing these scripts and sorting out a very complex uh, uh, material uh, in a very uh, handy and well-written uh, format for us. So uh, Emmanuel Kileru is a scientific coordinator with the ELD initiative. She used to be with the United Nations University, the Institute of Water, Environment and Health. And uh, Dr. Kileru holds a PhD in agri-environmental economics uh, from the University of Kent in the UK. So please, uh, Emmanuel, um, we'd love to hear more about stakeholder engagement, training and capacity building. Thanks, Claudia. I wanted to say also thanks to Thomas Falk, who's around, because um, he's, uh, he's been a great help in getting this book script um, together and uh, really, really useful feedback and anything. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today with you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry I haven't been more active online so far. I've, uh, I've had a very uh, busy time. I'm certainly not the only one. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping to catch up. Oh, that's getting too fast. Um, I'm hoping to catch up with you soon and discussions on that. And yeah, thank you so much for the initial feedback on the uh, discussion forum. That's really appreciated. It's really helpful to know what works and what works a little bit less well. Um, so it's it's really helpful. Um, so if I uh, if I followed the course correctly, you should now be uh, preparing a stakeholder engagement plan, reading the course script on conditions and skills required for successful engagement. Um, I know that some of you have listened to the podcast by the Guardian that I posted a link to on the online discussion area. It's um, called the biggest story in the world, and it covers basically some uh, some of the discussions that the Guardian staff team or editorial team have had in relationship to launching a campaign uh, to try and reach out to their readers in a slightly different way than they used to. Um, and I think that this is very good because it shows some of the processes that you might be getting through yourselves trying to put together your stakeholders plan. Um, so this presentation will be slightly different, uh, but I thought it would be nice to engage with you over the concept of training, capacity building, and um, trying to um, and an engagement and how they relate together. And it's some kind of a self-reflecting exercise over this book, and it's a slightly different perspective. But I hope um, I hope it will you'll find it interesting. Interesting. And it's focused mostly on education that's provided as a higher, higher education training, so university type of courses, lifelong learning training, vocational training, and not so much about primary and secondary education. Um, but you know, these principles may, may apply to these type of settings as well. It's a little bit broader. Um, I'll try and make the connection between higher education and some of the research processes and the putting together of your stakeholder engagement plan. I'm not sure why the slides are going fast forward. Um, it's, it's not meant to be. 
Um, so I'm just going to show you a cartoon that I really like, which is um, really about going beyond appearances for true engagement. And that cartoon, again, I'm not sure why the uh, presentation is not showing as a slideshow um, with the animation. Um, but this is a cartoon that says that, I'm trying to move across, it's, it's a Dilbert cartoon that says, before I make my decision, I'd like to ask for your opinions. It's meant to make you feel more engaged, you know, inverted commas, and, um, and you actually plan to listen to us. I'm hoping it will look that way on the outside. So, of course, this is not at all what we want. We want some true dialogue to be established. Um, to try and foster some true engagement. Um, I've included this cartoon because I think it's it's very good in showing that engagement can take different formats. Uh, so it could be participation, partnership, communication, extension, education, of course, being one of them. Um, now, this particular cartoon engagement is a slightly different definition than the one that's used in this core script, because uh, it also includes consultation as a form of engagement. Um, whereas in the core script, engagement is a two-way dialogue and requires a little bit more than just consultation with stakeholders. So it goes a little bit beyond. Um, so just, just pointing out that depending on the people putting together a text, engagement may have very different meaning to them. So it's worth trying to figure out what people mean by engagement. Um, so I, as I said, education is one one form of one possible form of engagement, uh, but it's not necessarily the exclusive one. Um, it could be complemented by parallel activities, and this is something that is becoming very important for development activities in particular. Uh, which try and integrate theoretical knowledge, practical knowledge, operational knowledge across different academic disciplines, across different economic sectors. And they're trying to mix that so that so as to achieve, so as to have impact and have real outcomes. Uh, I'll try and see what I can do with the sound. Sorry about that. Is it, is it better? Um, here I'm. I'm have the the sound is fine, um, Emma. But I'm not sure whether you're properly connected to. No, my headphones are not connecting, so it's the sound from my computer directly. Actually, that's louder. Is it? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, okay, go ahead. I switch off my sound and then we shouldn't have an echo. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so, do we want... Again, my apologies. As I said, I don't... I, don't know why this is not working the way I, I, you know, wanted it to. Um, so the question is now, do we want engagement for capacity building or capacity building for engagement? Um, the short answer would be a little bit of both. Because um, we, we can combine training and a level of engagement to try and increase capacity beyond what we could have without engagement. And by capacity here, we refer to knowledge and skills. Um, but we can also try and combine training and capacity building to try and increase engagement in other processes, such as parallel research processes, or generally speaking with an issue. Um, so this this is something, this, these increased capacity and increased engagement are two potential objectives of setting up a training program. And in this MOOC, it's a little bit of both as well. So I'll start with the first one and a few examples. Um, now, engagement and training for capacity building, um, that, that has changed.
quite a bit. Um, the way we do education has changed quite a bit, at least over the past decade. Um, it's changed a little bit before, but it's changed a lot over the past decade in particular. In relationship with um, new the development of new, particular online technologies that allow to create new format. And um, this is matching the parallel evolution in research processes. And there's been a change from um, the, the approach to learning and teaching with learning that was handed down from a professor, um, so instructor-led training, which is somehow represented on the bottom left of the slide, uh, with somebody in a crowd lower than the presenter shouting out, you can engage, it, engage us better down here. And that has changed to something that is that requires more active participation and engagement, and that is more learner-centered. Um, so it's it's more than a change in the format. Um, it actually matches a change in the philosophy behind how we see education and what what we see education should be. And how it should be run. So it's a, it's a deeper deeper thing. It's called a paradigm change. And um, with that paradigm change, there's been a diversification of the teaching and learning models um, that have been used to try and make learning and capacity building more effective. In particular, so there's the traditional on campus. Um, model which uh, which means that you go to university campus to learn something and it's based on face-to-face -face interaction you go to the library and read textbook textbooks um and then there's the off-campus mode which is what this MOOC is is about um so that involved self self-study that was part of the traditional way of learning and teaching but now increasingly distance learning the massive online open courses um, and other various forms of teaching and there's a new concept that has emerged um, a little bit recently and it's called blended learning and i like this definition because i think it captures very well um, what what it's meant to do and it's it's the design and delivery of the right content in the right format and using the right mix of media um, and this is really something that doesn't apply just to learning and teaching but that could also apply to the way you build your engagement plan um, which has to have the right content in the right format using the right mix of media and this is something that can combine on you know face-to-face -face teaching and learning as well as um, online learning. It's it's not constrained by a specific type of interaction, but it could mix mix all of them. And that has led as well to the development of lifelong and vocational training courses, because you're not constrained by a time frame where you have to have a lecture. You can just listen to it online, and this will be the same presumably for this MOOC's presentation too. to the next one. So this is a, an example um, taken from a paper that's published in, in an open open um, journal and it shows you the different resources that are used by the University of London um, and uh, there's, there's a color coding here. The red, red resources are the ones that are examinable because the people there are taking actual exam. Um, the ones in orange are provided um, by default or in a systematic way, but they, you know, people taking the course can choose to do them or not. Um, and then the green ones are things that are provided as an extra that you don't have to do it. But you know, of course, the more you cover, um, the better the chance you can get to increase your exam grade and your model grade. And um, and of course, um, it's it in a way is the MOOC is structured in a similar way um, with a course script um, with different quizzes and activities that um, Ali, Claudia, and Nico have set up and that that are meant to help you with your 
with your work. And then you have the assignments, which are the, the way this course will be assessed. And it, it just combines different forms of engaging with you, more or less. You know, the course script doesn't really engage with people. Uh, it's just you reading it. Um, but discussions on the, the online forums or the, the groups um, themselves to try and do the assignments might have a higher level of engagement. So we don't have necessarily the same level of engagement across the board. We're just trying to have different activities or different resources that people can use, which require, which will have different levels of engagement, um, but to try and foster the amount of things they're learning out of this module. And um, which links to the question of how do we measure this? Um, and one possible indicator of effective capacity building, which is the outcome in this case of the engagement process or some engagement process, um, would be to go beyond learning expectations. Uh, for instance, um, the ELD Secretariat had the survey last year for the ELD MOOC and um, they found that people perceived at the beginning, they had uh, some kind of an average level of knowledge on sustainable land management and land degradation, it's about a three, that's centered around there. There's the light green bars on the diagram. But at the end, they felt they had acquired a lot more knowledge on sustainable land management and degradation. So it's more of four and a five, the dark green bars on the diagram. And, you know, this might show that is a some capacity building that has been um, taking place uh, by going th by going beyond prior expectations of course this indicator is not perfect and it should be complemented by other ones i haven't particularly found any that i could show you today but this is again something you'll be confronted with in your own stakeholder manage management plan and we'll have to um engagement plan and we'll have to think about um, including them. And now to shift to the other other side of the coin, to the other the other perspective is that we can have training capacity building to try and increase engagement um, in other processes. And I've structured these slides along the five principles for engagement uh, by um, you know, from the paper by Mark Reed um, and and his colleagues, uh, written in two thousand and four, and that. That has the first one being the design. So you can design engagement in the way you design the training program. And that will have to do with the, you know, you can choose between format, media, and the timing of activities um, to try and include engagement activities in the design of the course. So for instance, the format could mix um, different textbooks, um, have key references, different scripts, uh, different lectures, tutorials, quizzes, discussions, group assignments, presentation. And again, not everyone will have the same level of engagement for each of the, uh, these activities. Um, you can also choose different media. So it could be face-to-face, -face, it could be computer, Communica communication through a computer. It could be communication that happens at the same time. So it's called synchronous. And uh, it could also be communication with a time delay, and that's called asynchronous. And you can also have different combinations. So you can have a little bit of face to face, a little bit of computer mediated communication, a little bit of synchronous communication, a little bit of asynchronous communication. Um, so again, this is up to you. Not not everyone will answer the same way to these um, these pointers, but it's it's something you can work on or try and balance the different aspects of it. Um, now, the timing of activities um, should match ideally the progression of the discussions and the cr critical reflection. And for instance, you can have an introduction to the concepts that are necessary to the discussion, um, since leveling the discussion field, which has been highlighted as very crucial to start off um, an engagement process on the right foot. Uh, and that could be done by a more top-down approach, you know, textbooks and key references, scripts, lectures, tutorials, and question and answers. Um, and that includes this, this MOOC script. And it could also be done through establishment of a common language through active participation. And that 
has to do with discussion, group assignments, and presentation. And how you time them, you might want to have them at the very beginning of the process, um, at the middle of the process, con on a continuous basis throughout the process, or you know, mix and match. You can have a little bit at the beginning, a little bit less throughout, and then another big peak at midpoint, and then a, another little bit throughout. Um, and this is up to you. And again, different people will react differently to how you set set it up, and it will lead to different engage uh, levels of engagement. Now the the represent concept um, that requires the identification of a target audience for establishment of the learning objectives and intended outcomes in in teaching and learning in particular. There's no there, there can be a little bit of stakeholder mapping, but it's really defining the the your intended target for you know, for whom do you write the material. And then this will shape the content that you're providing, and, and you can try and design different courses for different target audiences. But within one course, it will be very difficult to try and re have everyone represented in one go. So that's one limitation in that perspective. Um, the third principle is engaging, and that includes a clear identification of responsibilities and um, you know the the script write, writing could be um, the responsibility of academics. The moderation could be uh, the responsibility of professional moderators, and I'm sure Claudia is doing a very good job at it. Um, and you know the the assignments, the building up of the assignments is ultimately your responsibility. And making this explicit might might help, but also deter some people. You know, different people have different psychological profiles and some people will thrive in that way of learning and others won't. Um, so it's all about choosing and making these choices explicit and uh, there also needs to be some clear establishments of uh, establishment of the rules for the discussion and you know it could just be that we all agree to disagree um, because part of the engagement process to create a safe space for everyone to re to have a dialogue and to contribute as they wish. Um, even though we don't, ha we don't ha all have to agree on one thing. And again, depending on how the rules are set up and enforced, um, you might have different levels of engagement from different people. And this is also the way, uh, um, it also relates to the way groups are established, like their establishment of first come first come basis around common interests, around you know, whether they're friends already, if they've done an alphabetical order of names per geographical location, if the group is made as a one-off, or if you allow possible changes for dysfunctional groups later. Again, it will have different levels of engagement. I know some of you uh, have already uh, pointed out a few drawbacks of using group works to do the assignment, and that a few people may be free writing. Um, this is something that happens in real life, unfortunately, and um, you know you don't always choose the people you work with, and uh, sometimes it's about trying to find a way to make it work, even though it's not, it didn't start off well, and sometimes it's also about letting the possibility for people that didn't contribute much at the beginning to contribute later. You, know, you have. You all have different sets of strengths and skills, and some people will be very good content providers and ideas providers. Some people will be very good integrators to try and put it together in a plan, and some people will be very good editors. So it's it's about identifying who's you know who's doing what and how how you let everyone express themselves or use their strength to build up something in common. Um, and how how do you uh, measure the engagement with the course? Um, again, this is taken from the University of London um, course, uh, the paper that was published out of it. And I've highlighted that you know, the first uh, three resources that are the most frequently used are the ones that are examinable. But right afterwards, it's resources in green which are provided, but up to them to, um, up to the students taking this course to have a look at. And also the black diagram in the middle are resources that people go and look for for themselves. 
Um, and that could be an indicator they're engaging with the course material, they want to know more, and you know, they want to have a different perspective and complement, trying to build their critical thinking out of it. And I thought that was that could be one indicator of the level of engagement. Um, again, because it's not a perfect indicator, you need another one. Um, so another one could be also the uh, the compar comparison between the actual time spent studying. Um, so at at the beginning of the MOOC last year, um, most people thought they would spend less than five hours a week on the on the course. And uh, asking not quite the same people at the end, but roughly the people that finished, they um, more than half of them answered that they uh, spent uh, more than five hours in the course. So this difference could be linked to several things, um, you know, including the fact that it might be a different crowd um, answering the question. So it might be the 15% that were willing to spend five to ten hours a week at the beginning that remains in the course at the end and represents five percent of the people left uh, but i'd like i'd like to uh, i'd like to believe that this is because people um, actually enjoyed the course and wanted to provide more inputs in particular to the assignments um, we've had very good assignments last year uh, claudia says that we see that in this course already which is great and possible indicators of engagement with the course is also the number of group assignments that are completed. Um, online, online teaching or learning is often linked with a high drop-off rate. Um, so again, this is from last year's MOOC, and uh, it, we were down from 47 assignments completed in, in the assignment two down to 27, which is a little bit less than a 50% drop-off rate, which is pretty good for that type of um, interaction, um, mode of interaction. And um, this is a group assignment, so it masks that a lot of people individually dropped off, but the assignments themselves were carried on. Um, and that was thanks to a few key individuals that took responsibility for them and made it made it happen. Um, but that was that was a really good. Um, you know, for us, it's really uh, positive to see that people are staying on and completing the assignments and um, enjoying them. Uh, now to the fourth principle, which is to generate impact. And this is where really in, in capacity building and training, I can see the, the stick getting over to you progressively, um, more than staying with us. And this is where um, you know, you can generate impacts through the co-generation of products, um, and that could be you know, the group assignments you're working on that can have real life value, hopefully, and uh, be made into proposals or plans, and you know, be be brought forward by yourselves. Um, it could also be through the timing, and that's the timing within the course itself, in this case. Um, which is partly determined by the set time you know, for the webinars and the different activities, but it's also partly determined by yourselves, you know, when you decide to work on your assignment, when you think you have more time, um, and also the timing in the wider context. So the Guardian campaign is linked to the um, Conference of the Party of the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, the UNFCCC, in Paris in December this year. But the, the issue of sustainable land management can be tied to the 2015, to 2015 being the International Year of Soils, um, but also to different national initiatives such as Germany's One World, One Hunger initiative. Um, and again, working on this type of issue and engaging with people on this type of issue um, would be very, very prominent and your know, timing would be critical. Uh, and the last step, which is reflect and sustain, which should be a fifth. Um, so reflect is to learn as you get along and adapt accordingly. And that's valid for the trainers or the moderators, but also the participants themselves. You know, it's uh, learning is an ongoing process, not something that you can decide you're going to start and then end. You know, we pretty much learn throughout our lives. Um, so this is important to sometimes stop and reflect on it and see what you've learned and, and what, what you're still missing in a sense. Um, 
And in relationship to sustain, again, this is where the stick is definitely handed over to you because a big share of the responsibility to continue initiatives and you know, build momentum lies with the participant themselves. If they're willing to continue on their own for their own benefit and getting organized accordingly. Um, and that was something that came out of the LG MOOC 2014. Some of the participants requested that the platform would be maintained to allow for continued engagement uh, between them. Um, I think it has been, but I haven't seen much activity on it after the course ended. Um, again, this is up to the participants to continue the, the, and use the tools that were provided to them um, if they wish to. Uh, this is it. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them or you know, I'll be more than happy to discuss things with you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for sharing your thoughts on training and engagement. Thank you very much. I see some hands clapping here, very nice. And uh, thanks for bringing ELD MOOC 2014 back in a new, fresh context. I'd be happy to take some questions, each, either in the chat or um, in, uh, in an audio. If you want to uh, pose a question and uh, uh, have a headphone. I could take your audio questions if you um, uh, wish to do so. Please raise your hand and then I can uh, open your microphone. So if you have any questions then I'd be glad uh, to take those uh, before we start with our next speaker. Um, I don't see any raised hands so far, um, but I hear some sound. Um, so if we have somebody who would like to talk, otherwise, okay, Emma will be available. I think we are, um, with hay fever, it's always exhausting to talk for such a long time. So I think we let Emma go. And uh, if you have questions, uh, please write them in the forum and... Um, Emma, I'd be glad to take, but I, we can take that questions from Ephraim before I introduce you to Cesar. Um, hello, Cesar. Um, Emma, there was one question regarding the slide number eight um, about the output being a reliable indicator and go just beyond. Hello. Hello. Um, beyond expectations. Emma, would you like to take up on that? I think um, we've got the question here. Um, Okay, Emma is uh, answering in the chat. So I, I think we'll take the opportunity and um, introduce Cesar Morales. Welcome, Cesar. Hello, uh, good morning, good evening. Good, uh, I'm glad that you could make it. So we are ready to uh, listen to your presentation. I will switch off my audio in a minute, okay. but let me introduce Cesar um, at first. Uh, so welcome Cesar Morales. Cesar Morales is a consultant with 
ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. He used to be a regional project director with ECLAC uh, before and holds a PhD in the study of Latin American society. So please welcome with me Cesar Morales. Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Hello, Tobias. Hello, Claudia and Ali. Well, my presentation, my presentation is about the stakeholders' engagement and their contribution to establish the cause of degradation, land degradation, and drought. It's based in some experience from Latin America. We have made some studies from, uh, for, in, in Latin America. Um, the presentation is based on these studies and the experience of this study. First of all, um, I can say that wait, 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 wait. Latin America has an um, area of 21 million of square kilometers uh, where lives a population uh, of around 630 million people, which from which around 180 million are in poverty um, from this, uh, this total, 70 million are extremely poor or are in indigenous. A quarter of the total area of the region correspond to arid and semi-arid and dry humid lands. That is called dry lands. And three quarters of them present degradation problems where lives around 83 million people. Most of them living in poverty too. Some examples, in Brazil, for instance, dry lands cover more than one, three hundred million square, uh, million square kilometers, and where lives 34 million people. Around half of them living in poverty, uh, below the poverty line. In Argentina, more than two thirds of the territory are dry lands. Uh, where lives around 9 million people. In Mexico, dry lands cover 60% of the territory and where live more than 30 million people. In Chile, around 62 of the country is affected by some kind of erosion and degradation problems. A significant part of the territories, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and El Salvador in Central America is affected by problems of land degradation due mainly to the intensive deforestation process. <clears throat> um, almost all the governments are involved in one way or in other in combat desertification, land degradation, and drought, and concerned about the social and economic impacts on the affected population. We need to know or to have an idea about the cause of the degradation and degradation and drought. In order to compare this with the action cost to decide the most efficient economic and social investment that can be done to combat degradation, justification, and drought. Uh, in spite of this, very few is known about the implied cause of losses due to desertification and degradation and drought. And the causes are mainly the lack of information, the discussion about the a general accepted methodology to measure it. In general terms, we can say that the causes are significant, mainly if we consider the impacts, we add the impacts of the climate change and drylands under vulnerability. We have made the following studies in Bolivia, Paraguay, Peru as a country, and a, study, and a specific study for the Pula region in the north, in Chile between the regions four to seven region. That means the north and the central and central south part of Chile, in Ecuador, in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Guatemala. He recently made or studies in course in Chile, a more detailed study 
and we're actually making right now and started to update the status of cost of uh, certification and aggregation. And we are making local level plans to combat the certification, land degradation, and drought in 10 counties between the fourth region, that means around 400 kilometers from Santiago to the north, and the metropolitan region, that means uh, the region around Santiago, that is the capital, and in the fourth region, that means around 200 kilometers from Santiago to the south. <clears throat> The problem is if we may study for national, regional, or local authorities, or we may, I noticed a mistake, or we, or we may study with national, regional, or local authorities. That is quite important because if we may study with national, local, and regional authorities and with all kinds of stakeholders, the study is much more powerful. I would like to present uh, one experience that we have made in Peru, in the north of Peru, in the Pura region. The Pura region is a very important region, it's a very emblematic region, because it's the most affected region probably in Peru by the certification and degradation, mainly by salinization of soil. Of soil. Uh, it's a region where between Pura and Guayaquil in Ecuador, it's originated the phenomena of the El Niño current. According to the fourth national report to the UNCCD, one third of the Peru surface is in some state of desertification. That means around uh, 3.8 million hectares. And in total, that reached 30 million of hectares. That means around 23% of the territory of Peru. Here is a map that we can say the, uh, in the brown areas, the erosion problems. The certification is the gray areas, and in red, the, salinis the salinisated areas. As you can see, in the north, in the extreme north of Peru, that, that is Pura, I am showing Pura, is probably one of the most affected parts of Peru by salinization. In numbers, in the case of Pura, we have around uh, a total area of uh, 70, uh, 700 around years. Seven, uh, 700 hectares of affected area. It, as you can see, the, one of the main problems are salinization, a problem with drainage. Area of the certification caused by high concentration of salt and sodium, it's around 15%. That is quite high. <clears throat> that is the landscape in the dry forest in Peru, in the affected areas in the Pura region. And I would like to, 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 to share the methodology that we made, we applied with the, with the stakeholder, what called a stakeholder approach. We organized workshops first to define the outline, content, and methodology of the, methodology of the study At, with a regional government, with regional specialized agencies and with the German Cooperation for a Sustainable Environmental Program and with ECLAC, ECLAC is the Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean. We organized two workshops with qualified, qualified informants at national, regional, and local levels. And we create an interinstitutional coordination body 
with the participant of all involved agents and organizations, academia in Pura, uh, national level two, and qualified informants at all levels. Uh -huh. For the information, we get information from the regional government, from the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, and Irrigation, from the National Meteorological Services, from the GRC, from the, U, the European Union, GRC is the Joint Research Center. We get um, high resolution maps from them, and from the National Institute of Statistics, from CEPAL, ECLAC, and other institutions. The type of information were time series of production, yields, area and micro data from agricultural census, population, gender, poverty, and consumption service. The econometrical uh, approach, the methods to estimate the losses, we use econometrical approach based in production functions, yield function, turnquist productivity index, replacement cost, erosion cost, all of them for affected and non affected areas. The idea was to compare affected with non affected areas in terms of productivity, in terms of gross uh, product, and uh, the difference was, uh, was identified such as losses. We used maps, high resolution maps from the GRC, and the most important part, workshops with qualified informants to validate methodology, information, and results. I would like to highlight this for validate the methodology, the information, and the results. The validation workshops with the local stakeholders one of the key activities for achieving the study's objectives was to hold workshops with local technicians and producers. And the purpose of this meeting was to collect data from the local stakeholders on production and the certification. That is because not always information provided by the ministries or by the local agencies, agencies are uh, good information. And we need to review this information and to compare with, uh, with uh, or discuss or analyze with the local stakeholders to validate data collected or, pro uh, or produced by the project in line with the stakeholders' knowledge and perceptions. That is quite important. Observe in situ areas uh, for which local stakeholders' perception diverged from the data obtained for the project. We, many times, or sometimes at least, we finalize correcting the information, the original information, with the contribution, based in the contribution of the stakeholder. We organized three workshops in the Pura region, one of them in the coast, the other one in the middle region, and the other one in the mountains. The Pura region covered from the coast to the mountains. Uh, we come with the uh, support of the um, GI seed program. The meetings, the workshop meetings, were very, very, very interesting. Uh, I'm showing some photos of the um, some of these meetings. Um, we obtained very valuable information. For instance, one of the most um, Important experience was in the course in the first or in the first uh, workshops. One of the participants showed to us that the satellite information was not correct because the satellite has difficulties to distinguish the color, the green color, and uh, was showing in one county called Il Tayan a uh, surface affected by degradation, but according the people that lives in this area, the area was much uh, more significant. And the reason why was because a plant can grow only when the um, 
content of salt is quite high. So the satellite only see the green color and hide the real situation. We, after that, the, after the workshop, we visited the area and we confirmed that the affected area was much more significant than original we observed from the satellite information. And we obtained this uh, similar results in the mountains too, in connection with deforestation process. The deforestation process was, in fact, much more significant than the maps or the information from the maps give, uh, uh, give an idea to us. As you can see in the photo, for instance, this is a plant that can grow only when uh, the content of salt is uh, very high. But behind the plants, as you can see in the white part, all of them are salt. This soil is absolutely degraded. Instead, uh, but in spite of, the satellite can observe only the color green. Uh, if you don't discuss with the stakeholders, the local stakeholders, and qualify the informants, probably you can make a big mistake assigning to this soil the condition of non degraded The second one workshop was in the mountains, in the Carmen de la Frontera. And the problem was more or less equivalent because the deforestation process was very intensive and the satellite uh, doesn't show this uh, situation. <clears throat> Which kind of regional institutions, organizations participate with us? Uh, obviously, the regional government through the Natural Resources and Environmental Division, the National North Association to fight uh, desertification and drought, the Regional Institute to Support of Management Water Resources, the Autonomous Authority of Pura Chira Basin. Well, a lot of agencies, local agencies, the German Corporation, the Regional Direction of Agriculture, water uses or user organizations from the low, medium, and high pure sector, the irrigation communities from each valley, and the regional and local authorities of each valley. All of them participate in the three workshops that we have organized in, um, for validate information, preliminary results, and final results. After that, we made a workshop with the national authorities to discuss with them the results and the impact of the degradation, desertification, and drought. Obviously, with the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change, and the Certification Division, the Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation, and the Ministries of Finance and Economy, because economical impact of this process. With the Academy, we discussed with the Pacific University of Peru, the Royal University of La Molina, the University of Pura, the Engineering College, and the School of Agronomies. We discussed with them mainly the results and the impacts too. <clears throat> I would like to show some results. In the case of uh, Pura, when we apply the production and yield function to specify, specify from the main agricultural activities for in each productive, productive valley, the losses reach 13.7% of the agricultural gross domestic product annually. And we applied the replacement cost method, losses were well, 13.3%, that's quite similar. And we apply the torque index, index, the losses were around 13%. So, independently the methodology applied to measure the losses, more, uh, 
all of them are around 13 percent <clears throat> when we apply it uh, one more methodology the erosion cost and the erosion associated cost we estimate a little bit much uh, higher losses, around 15%. Based in the above, uh, in, the, uh, in this, the cost of the certification, land degradation, and drought could range, according to our estimation, from 13 to 15% of the agricultural uh, growth of, um, product. But that is annually. That it's a, a very high cost for this region. And must be noticed that is a cost only in sight, because off site there are all the costs that uh, must be measured in a second stage. That is quite important to consider for this region of Fura, because uh, for the irrigation in a, in appropriated soils, for instance, there are a lot of problems of um, with the um, uh, channel of irrigation with salinization, etc., etc., etc. In the case, in the case uh, of Chile, we are trying to replicate exactly the same methodology. methodology. The idea is to, first, we have discussions with uh, local authorities at uh, county level, that means in communal level, for each province inside each region. And then for the regional authorities, that in the case of Chile, the regional governments, and then with the national uh, government. Uh, According to our results, sorry, the impacts of or the cost of the land degradation certification are around more or less the same too. Around 14 to 15 percent. It's quite similar of the case of uh, Pula region. In the case of Ecuador, we have made exactly the same and we have validated all the intermediate results information and final results with one delegate one representation for each province Ecuador has uh, 27 provinces located in the coast one of them and the other in the mountains and the others in the uh, region called Oriente and in Costa Rica we have made exactly the same we had uh, made uh, a discussion in and at the county level with national authorities and with regional authorities too. And we apply it more or less the same methodology. Replacement cost, we have used it, econometrical approach, index, etc., etc., and all of them more or less reach more or less the same results. As a conclusion, we can say that without the participation of the stakeholder, in each stage of the of the research, we lost a lot of possibility to a curiosity, and we lost, a, or in other words, we can make a lot of mistakes. It is quite important because, as we uh, as we uh, as I explained it before, the possibility to correct some mistakes, for instance or some data or basic information about the affected area can be high because a satellite, for instance, when we have maps, hide the real affected area. So independently the methodology applied, the stakeholder approach is the key factor to minimize the mistakes or to, to, in order to get more uh, or better results, more accuracy and better results. Well, that is.
uh, all I can say, we're trying to do right now uh, 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 look at plans to combat it in these studies and take it into account the cost of land degradation, desertification in the case of Chile, at county level, plans to combat uh, desertification. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you, Cesar. Thank you for this uh, great presentation on land degradation in Latin America. I'm, I was really uh, found it very interesting to learn that stakeholders can not only be integrated in, in the process of improving the, the land management, but already in the process of gathering data and that local stakeholders can even help um, improve data that had been gathered by sophisticated technology as uh, satellites. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take uh, questions. Um, anyone may write um, a question in the chat or uh, if you want to uh, ask a question and uh, talk in this session, uh, please raise uh, your hand and I'll open the microphone. Um, so it was a very clear um, presentation and I, w I was wondering um, um, how much uh, do, oh, okay, um, here is Ali's questions. Uh, which which country in Latin America can be described as having the most difficult situation so far, Cesar? Well, um, probably I think it's in Central America countries such as Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Honduras. We want to to make a new study, some more detailed in order to have much more uh, robust results. But our first vision is uh, that these countries probably are one of the most affected countries. There are one more country that I have not mentioned it, that is Haiti. Haiti is by far the most affected country, probably one of the most affected countries in the world by degradation. But, uh, well, the other, uh, the affected area, it's quite uh, impressive in the case of Chile, in the case of Argentina, and the case of Mexico. But the intensity of the problem could be the world in the case of Haiti, and the other countries I have mentioned is for Central America. Okay. There's another question. Uh, which is your main council for stakeholder coordination? Well, I think it is absolutely, absolutely crucial to organize from the starting the participation of the stakeholders in each stage. I like very much presentation of uh, that have made uh, Emmanuel. So congratulations, Emmanuel, first, because permit uh, allow us to have a um, base in fact an idea of the um, how to organize the much more scientific way the participation of the stakeholders. Well, in short. Uh, a few words. The participation of stakeholders must be taken into account from the starting to the end of the study. When we plan the study, when we define the methodology, when we select the areas, when we have the, 
when we when we get the information when we have the first preliminary results at, at the end and each stage because independently the sophistication of the methodology the sophistication of the tools we need always to compare with the perception provided by people that live in the problem mm -hmm. i don't know if i answer your question there's one question following up on that, and that is, do you prepare different roles? So, sorry? Do you prepare different roles? Different roles. Roles. Roles, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, right now we're trying to in the case of the studies we are making right now at this moment at local level in each county in the fourth region, metropolitan region, like sixth region of the Chilean, uh, the Chilean case, we are preparing a, a specific uh, uh, approach for each kind of uh, stakeholder for each county. It's a very detailed uh, work, but it's very crucial according to us. Okay, there's another question. Uh, you had mentioned about conducting three workshops in different location. In the were there were there participants that were always invited to these workshops aside from national ministries? Or well, in the case of these three workshops. Well, in fact, first, we have made much more than three workshops. I mentioned three in different areas of Pura region because where, where the final workshops to discuss with the stakeholders and qualified informants the final results in order to correct or to adjust any result. I mentioned it that one of them was made in the coast side of the Pura region, the other one in the middle area, and the other one in the mountains. But previously we have made uh, originally a workshop with the national and regional and local authorities to plan to plan the, the study with the participation of the German cooperation too. And at the end we have made a final workshop in the capital in Lima with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Environment, uh, the main representative or authorities at uh, national level to analyze the impact and discuss with them the impact, economic and social impacts of the certification and devaluation. Uh, I am seeing one question. Different shows. I where guess. they perceived that we're always invited to all of these workshops aside the national. We we get the the participants with the support of the local programs in the region and the local agents. For that, was quite important the support of the regional government of the region and the GIC the cooperation, because they are working in the field always. They supported that. We have talked with the representative of the national, local, and regional organization of uh, producers, the small farmers. Uh, we invited them for each workshop to participate. And the participation was very, very interesting, very active. They was very interested in to put their point of view, their perceptions about the impacts, the affected areas, um, everything. It was very active participation. Okay, we have time for one last question, but otherwise it's had been a lot, very long and at the same time very fascinating session. Thank so thank you, very much. Well, thank you Cesar, thank you Emmanuel, uh, thank you to all those who joined us uh, today.
Now comes the fun part. We'll open our webcams. So get ready. Click on your webcam. Let me open them. Mm. Now is time to say goodbye. You need to click on your webcam. Here we are. Uh, on your webcam to be visible. I see Ali, uh, uh, Ephraim. Ladies, where are you? Ephraim, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Tobias, hi, how are you? Emmanuel, thanks bye very bye. much to all. Bye-bye, bye Liberty. Thank you, See you. Thank, it was great having you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. See you You're again. welcome. Bye -bye. See you again. Bye-bye. So, there are some online. I see Anatoly, I see Christine. Hello, I saw you online. Kirstin, Liberty has already left. Martin, my friend Panaton. Very Thanks to everybody for your page. <laughs> Oh, hello, Christine. Hello, Christine. <laughs> Good to finally see you. Okay. Bye-bye, okay. okay. Cesar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Uh, okay. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay, Liberty is still there. Okay, yeah. glad to have you. Uh, it's always nice to see friends from the first MOOC in the, this session. Okay. Thank you. by FM, okay, Christine's still there, Teresa, still there, by Panaton, study hard, I know that you're doing well in your exams, and, oh, exam on Friday, I keep my fingers crossed that you do well in the final exams, but I'm sure you'll do a fine job. Ali, where's your webcam and your microphone? There he is. <laughs> Hey, it's right over here, so <laughs> if you can hear me well and everyone, thanks a lot for being here. And uh, appreciation goes to Cesar and Emma for their informative presentation so far. Uh, we can stop the recording, I would say.